301 on both my machines. They finally agree. That's great. Okay, um, today we're going to talk about histograms and then much of the rest of the week, the entire rest of the week is going to be about the central limit theorem. So towards the end of class, I'm going to try to introduce the central limit theorem. Uh, depending on how our discussion of statistics and context and histograms goes with our examples, the examples are probably what will take the longest. Um, we'll only get like 15, 10, something like that, 10 or 15 minutes about the central limit theorem. But then we have three videos following for Wednesday or the remainder of the week, however you decide to break up your uh, the lectures for the rest of the week. Um, that's going to try to introduce the central limit theorem in various different ways. So we're going to get a formal mathematical way, probably the least favorite of most people. We'll get um, a random number generation in R, which will probably be more engaging for some. And hopefully the most engaging will be an interactive experience with the central limit theorem. I'm providing you a quick video that just shows you how to interact with two different websites. And then I'm going to leave it to you all to interact with the websites on your own after the video shows you how. So hopefully by the end of the week, we will have a reasonable grasp on the central limit theorem from at least one of those angles, one of those viewpoints, whether it's in R via simulated data, whether it's via an interactive website, or maybe the math kind of just does it for you. Um, trying to give you three different ways to try to attach yourself to the central limit theorem because it is probably the most important theorem in applied statistics that we have. But it does take um, twisting your understanding of statistics just a little bit. So um, that's a look at today, uh, statistics and context. We have seen it before and I'm probably gonna repeat it again after this week as we learn more in the world of statistics, I think this, the way I frame stats will be more understandable to you as we go. So I'm gonna try again and hopefully you'll get more out of it this time around. Then we'll do histograms with some examples in R and central limit theorem for the rest of the week. Um, before we get started on that, I would like to make one announcement. Yeah, all I can think of is right now one announcement, and then I'll open up the floor for questions if you all have any questions about anything or whatever before we get started. So here's my announcement. Uh, this class is actually a sequence of three courses. Um, this is the first in the sequence, much like there's Calc 1, 2, and 3. Um, in fact, there's Calc 4, 5, and 6 also, but those aren't the popular ones. Uh, this is the first in a sequence of three courses. And normally the third course, Math 450, depends on the second course in the sequence, which itself depends on the first. But because this last year has been um, kind of crazy for everyone, uh, Dr. Kathy Gray, who's teaching Math 450 next semester, decided to jump ship a little bit on the standard curriculum and instead open up Math 450 to anybody who's had Math 350. And she's going to talk about a topic near and dear to my heart because it's uh, basically all I do in the world of statistics for my own research. Um, so I'm going to type into the chat the words I'm using. <laughs> Uh, Math 450 in Fall 21 will talk about Bayesian statistics, and that is the main focus of my uh, statistical research. And she's going to open it up for anybody in uh, who has taken Math 350. So if you all uh, are even somewhat interested in a math minor, which I think you should be at this point, because by the time you take Math 350, you guys are super close to a math minor. I'd highly stress Math 450 as being an excellent topic for uh, to round out your math minor. Um, I think that was my one announcement. I have something telling me in the back of my head that there was a second announcement to make, but I can't think of it. So we're going to move on. Does anybody have any questions about this, that, or the other before we get started with our agenda for the day?
Nothing. No questions. Stats is fun. Let's just do it. Okay, then we're going to. Um, okay, step one, stats in context. You've seen it before, you're gonna see it again. Hopefully it'll be more meaningful as the semester progresses. And it starts out as you have seen before. Um, with distributions. This is where we have spent most of the time in this class. So the idea is there is some numerical variable you're interested in, and it follows some distribution. Now, it might be like US adults' heights. I don't know why you'd be interested in US adult heights, but maybe you are. Maybe you're like in a clothing company or something. Now, the distribution, the pattern, the distribution, a pattern that represents the heights of US adults um, looks something like this. Most people kind of fall into a bulk um, height. We're all kind of somewhere between like five foot and six foot five is kind of the bulk of all heights. And there is a mean height. It's probably something around five foot, 10 inches. But below that, there's some short people, but they are not the most common. And there's some tall people, but they are not the most common. And most people call, um, fall somewhere in between. Or maybe you're interested in something like economics and you're interested in people's incomes. Now there is a distribution that represents people's incomes and it has a long right tail, which I'm drawing over here. The long right tail really describes very rich people and the low density of the long right tail is suggesting that there's really not too many people who make exorbitant outcomes. Most people have outcomes kind of near this um, 30,000 to 150,000 range. And there's a few people who make very little money kind of hovering around here down near zero. And there's some small, small, small proportion of people who make extremely large incomes like um, think Bill Gates or other you know high tech um, executives sort of things. So distributions over here on the distribution side are sometimes referred to as a population. Now at first glance it doesn't quite make sense why they refer to this side as the population. But the logic comes from the fact that many times the distributions are representing people. So you're to think of like a population of people. Or we're interested in the population of people's incomes. Somehow it's related to the people. And so we often use the word population to describe this side of the world of statistics. Now, it would be nice if stats just used one word or the other, population or distribution, but in fact, it's a little bit something more uh, obnoxious. Sometimes people will use just the word population to describe the distribution of whatever variable it is they're interested in. Sometimes people will use just the word distribution. Sometimes people will say, population distribution. And all three are common in the uh, vocabulary of the world of statistics. So you can almost think of these as synonyms that sometimes just get crunched together into one new phrase. Okay, so here we go. The world of statistics then seeks to learn things about the population by sampling data. And the idea is you take a sample from the population that is, and hopefully you randomly 
sample from the population. The key word there randomly is suggesting if you're interested in learning about um, US adults' heights, you don't want to inadvertently only end up with um, shorter people from your sample, or you don't want to inadvertently end up with only really tall people from your sample. Your sample would be messed up if you only ended up with um, Google executives in your sample. You wouldn't get a very good understanding of most people's incomes if you only ended up with NBA players in your sample. So the goal is to learn something about the population distributions by taking a random sample. And once you get a sample, you then have a subset of the sample. You'd only have capital N data points. So over here, we're on a data side. And that's to suggest that you only have a subset, a smaller size set of data than exists in the real world. And we call this side data or sample side. And sample, you must recognize, is now showing up as a different type of word. Here, it's a verb. This is an action. You are pulling from the population. You're pulling from that distribution to collect data. And now you have a sample of data. And the same issue happens with these two phrases. Sometimes people use just the word sample. Sometimes people use just the word data. Sometimes people will say sample data set and they'll kind of combine the two into a new phrase. So to bring this back a little bit more mathematically, the population is imagined to be infinite. The population is imagined to be infinite, even if it's not. Like the population of US adults, there is not an infinite number of adults, but we often just think of it like that, just because it's easier. And so you're sampling from this infinite collection of data points, and you obtain by randomly collecting data, randomly sampling data, only a subset of them, some finite collection of data points. Another way to think of this population side as being infinite is theoretically, in the world of math, you could flip a coin nonstop forever. Theoretically, you could flip a coin forever. And we'd have to talk about some weird things like the coin is never going to break down in the material it's made of. But whatever, as statisticians, we don't actually discuss that sort of thing. All we really say is, theoretically, you could flip a coin forever. And that's on the population side. We're not going to flip a coin forever. Instead, what we're going to do is maybe just flip the coin capital N times. Okay, so we've kind of made it this far in the world of statistics. What we've been building up to a little bit more is statements like this. If you have your vector of data represented as X with a tilde under it, we are starting to learn that if you take the mean of that vector, what you're actually doing is approximating an expectation. If you calculate the mean of your sample, of your sample, if you calculate the mean of your sample, you just add up all the data points in your sample and divide by however many there are. What you're actually doing is approximating an expectation that lives in the population side of statistics. You are approximating that expectation. And you know what? Thinking about the population as infinitely large, in fact, can help you understand how this approximation works. This approximation is actually a limit as your sample size n goes off to infinity. Now, intuitively, what you should be thinking is, if your sample is going off to infinity, then really what you're doing is collecting every US adult from the population. And once you have every US adult from the population, 
you know the population mean. You know the mean, the expected value of the random variable itself. You know the mean of that distribution. So once you collect all the people there are, you have effectively taken your sample size off to infinity. So there is both an intuitive sense behind this and a mathematical sense behind this. Hopefully the intuitive sense is easy enough. You just imagine collecting all US adults in the population until you have everyone there. And mathematically, this is what we're going to start looking at this week, that this limit actually tells us things. Uh, there are things to be learned from taking a limit here. That's how we should phrase this. There are things to be learned from taking a limit here. And that's what we're going to slowly do to get into the central limit theorem. So I guess I'm going to pause here for a minute and make sure that everybody's okay with the pictures we've just drawn before we understand uh, next histograms so that we can build towards what this limit of a mean is going to tell us. How do we get the tilde under the X? Oh, you know what? In R, we never really have that. Um, the only reason I'm putting the tilde there is so that we can see mathematically that that X is supposed to represent your entire vector of data. Oh, so, so it's not one. just one X, it's the total data? Correct, that's all I'm trying to do. But like when we do things in R, when we call the mean of X, X is just the letter X with no tilde on it. Okay, thanks. Yeah, I mean, if you absolutely need a tilde in there, I don't know how you get it. I know you can get a tilde above the X, like this. I think the question was thinking about course notes. Is that what you're thinking about, Jacob? Yeah, to put it into R. Thanks, Will you be satisfied with a tilde on top or maybe just a note next to it that says X here is meant to be a vector? Yeah, I'll just put X is meant to be a vector. Great. Thanks to you both. And to clarify, the sample data is lowercase x, and then mean is lowercase x, and then your expected value is capital X. You got it, Jared. Thanks. OK. Yeah, the way um, statistics notation works is all lowercase letters, which happen on the sample side, are meant to be individual data points. And the capital letter x, is meant to be a random variable, which you should think of as representing the entire distribution. And so the capital letters only exist on the distribution side. Nice, great questions. Um, any others? Okay, then here we go for histograms. So I'll draw on this page what a histogram does. And then we will talk about it with um, a few examples that I've planned. So a histogram is a new plot we have not looked at before. And it's very similar to a density plot in that it's an attempt to represent the distribution's density using only data. The only difference is that a histogram creates bins. A histogram creates bins like this. And then there is no smoothed line. So the density plot is the smooth line. And a histogram is these bins, like a jagged or a discretized, a discrete representation of a density function using only data. Okay, so here we go. Histogram is for a single numeric variable. 
So numeric, meaning it can be discrete or continuous as long as it's just numbers. And a histogram is a representation of the density function using only a sample of data. I feel like my handwriting has a what got better after some time in this class and now is dipping back, back down <laughs> into getting worse. If at any point you can't read anything, please don't hesitate to say so. I won't take offense. Okay, so a histogram is uh, for a single numeric variable. There's no um, letters or names or labels in uh, the data set for a histogram. And what we're doing is trying to represent the density function from which the data came using only the data and no other information, using only the data. So I'm going to go to this website data sets found on my website under meta. I'm going to move kind of fast through this for a few reasons. One, you've seen me load data sets before. Two, I don't expect you to follow along with the code right now. I'm going to develop some code using, to start with, the spam base email. And I will post all the code I develop in this video on my website after class. So you'll have all the code in um, a self-contained R file for you. So I don't expect you to follow along right now. I'm going to move kind of fast. So I do expect you to look at the pretty pictures that I make instead of trying to keep up with my typing. To make a histogram, you'll use the function named hist on some numeric variable. So in this case, I'm going to plot the variable named spam that I'm extracting from the data set named email. Whoops. And here it is. This histogram has bars has bins. So I'm going to type this word into the chat. This histogram has two bins. Each one of these gray boxes is a bin that contains some numbers, some data points, some observations from your data set. Because the variable spam contains only zeros and ones, this histogram contains one bin for all of the number zeros, for all of the data points zero, and one bin for all of the ones in the data set. And all you do is create a bin of some width. The bins are some width. In this case, they're a width of only the single point zero. And then however many data points there are, will fill the bin such that you get a height equal to the number of zeros in the data set. However many data points fall in each bin dictates the height of that bin. So here is the bin for ones. And the height of the bin corresponds to however many ones there are in the data set. So really, since this table is hard to read any exact uh, since this histogram is hard to read any exact numbers from, what we can see is there are more emails that are not spam. They're marked zero. They are not spam. There are more not spam emails than there are spam emails. So in fact, this histogram is just a representation of this table. And in fact, this table is almost more informative because it gives us exact counts of the number of zeros in our data set. 
So this isn't the ideal case for a histogram, but it does work out in this case. So let's go find a new data set to start expanding our understanding of histograms. The next one I'm going to pull up is going to be found in this folder and it's named admissions. Okay, so while you while I am loading the data set into R, I want you all to try to guess what type of distribution this data came from. So let me explain the data a little bit. Major A is a disguised name for some major at UC Berkeley. So in this first row, this is men that applied to Major A. 62 were admitted and there was 825 applicants. Into major B, I don't know what year this was, into major B, all the men, 63 admitted, and there was 560 applicants. So use that information to try to figure out what type of distribution this is. Any takers? Is it a gamma distribution? No, it's not gamma because gamma represents continuous data. And these seem to be only integers. So it's some sort of discrete distribution. What if you thought of the number of applicants as being flips of a coin? And 63 is like heads, right? That's Bernoulli. how many times you got. Say it again. Is Bernoulli what you're looking for? We're close. What happens when you add up a bunch of Bernoullis? Was it binomial? There we go. This is binomial data. It's a little concealed. It's hard to see, but this is indeed binomial data. You got to think of it this way. Think of the 825 as flips of a coin. This is some weird unfair coin that decides whether or not you get into major A at UC Berkeley. There's 825 applicants and only some of them show up as heads. 62 of the 825 flips were admitted. And the other, I don't want to do math in front of you all, that'll be embarrassing. The other 825 minus 62 did not get admitted. So they were either admitted or not. And there is theoretically some probability that the each student was admitted. So this is indeed well-concealed binomial data. And in order to make a histogram about this data, we're gonna use the variable admitted. So how many um, students were admitted? Extracted from the data frame I have named admissions. Okay. And our takeaway from this is a few things. One the histogram is automatically adapting to the data. The histogram is automatically adapting to the data. So what you can see here is this first bin chose to be of width 0 to 20. Now we got to be a little bit careful because it looks like bin 1 and bin 2 kind of both fall right on 20. So in fact, what happens is the left edge of the bin is defined to be exclusive. That is with, if you're going to write it out as an interval, it would use a parenthesis 
instead of a square bracket for the lower end of the interval defining this first bin. And the right end point or the upper end point of this first bin is inclusive. So you'd use a square, that's not too square, a square bracket to represent inclusive. And if you want to get um, into the details of a histogram, you can type question mark hist to pull up the help file for the histogram. So here is the top of this help file. And if you scroll way down here into the details section, you can see a description of the types of intervals that each bin is defined by. So this type of interval where the lower bound A is excluded and the upper bound B is included is how the intervals for a histogram are defined. So in fact, this first bin goes from zero exclusive with a parenthesis to 20 inclusive with a square bracket. And it turns out there was two observations in this first bin. And the second bin was defined from 20 exclusive. So if there was an observation with exactly 20 students admitted, it would go into the first bin, not the second. The interval defining the width for the second bin is 20 exclusive up to 40 inclusive. And it turns out there are seven observations in this bin. And this is the histogram automatically adapting to your data set. Notice this bin here has zero data points in it. The bin with zero data points right here goes from 40 inclusive, no, exclusive, up to 60 inclusive. From 40 exclusive to 60 inclusive. This next bin here goes from 60 exclusive to 80 inclusive. And then the last bin, which has been chosen for you, goes from 80 exclusive to 100 inclusive. Now, it turns out, and here's the second piece to be taken away from this, histograms are not always easy to interpret. I actually told the first class wrong what this histogram was. Someone asked, and I thought I remembered that the uh, data set was about individual students, but it's not. The data set, if you recall, is about individual majors broken up by gender. And so in fact, this bin right here, zero to 20, is saying that there is two data points that fall into the bin of admitted applicants from zero to 20. And so this is either two different majors, or it could be two of the same majors, one for men and one for women. So in fact, we can look. The only numbers that are between zero and 20 are F, so that's major F for men and major F for women. So this first bin right here consists of only major F for the observations of men and women. So we're going to continue on the page of the histogram is automatically adapting to the data set to best represent the density function from which the data came. Let's try one more data set. OK, I thought I was going to get clever in the last class and use the data set on penguins, because penguins are fun. But then somebody asked a follow-up question that ruined my example with penguins. So we'll just see how it goes for you all. So we'll create a data set named penguins by reading in that file. Then we'll create a histogram of penguins. Let's do body mass. And the reason I picked the data set originally was because this data set is terrible in that it puts variable names with units. You would think that would be really helpful, but it's not. 
do not put units in your variable names. If you want to include units, put them in a different spreadsheet. You don't want them inside your data set because A, it's only going to make you type more. B, when you end up with micrograms, you're going to freak out and not know whether to use a U or an M or an MU, and then you're going to get some terrible variable name that A, requires a lot of typing, and B, you can never remember. Just don't put uh, units in your variable names. See that? And it's already breaking us up because of those underscores being silly. Anyway, here's a histogram of penguins. Once again, the histogram has automatically adapted to the data set. We see that there are approximately five penguins whose body mass is between 2,500 and 3,000 grams. The next bin represents something like 65, maybe 65 ish penguins whose body mass is between 3,000 and 3,500. It turns out in this data set, the majority of penguins seem to be somewhere between 3,500 and 4,000 grams. So this is giving us an understanding of where the penguin's body mass is kind of located in terms of grams. Is it closer to 1,000 or is it closer to 4,000? This histogram is telling us penguin's body mass tends to be around 4,000 grams at least for this population of penguins. I don't know where these penguins are from. If you want to know, you could go read the help file. Okay, I'm gonna pause for a minute because that was our whirlwind tour of histograms. Is everybody okay with what these things are doing for us? Okay, we're going to call it there then. Histograms, a representation of the density function from which the data originally came. A representation of the density from which the data came. It's not bad. You can think of these as like a density plot. If you just kind of connected a smooth line through all of the center points of the bins. You could imagine a smooth line connecting these bins together. And that's just a density function representation. Um, the key here is that we are only using the data. I have not claimed knowledge of the distribution from which the data came. We have only used the data. Okay, so here we go. We're going to then use these histograms to help us understand the central limit theorem. OK, so I'm going to generate some fake data to help us understand this theorem. And then we'll quickly use a histogram to help us get a better understanding of what the theorem is telling us. The way you're to think about the central limit theorem starts with imagining your vector of data as being a random sample. So here's how I want you to imagine this highlighted vector of data is a random sample. Because it's random, the idea is if you went out into this population of penguins and you randomly sampled, you would get some data set. If I went out into that population of penguins, the same population, and I took my own random sample, I would get a different data set. The data would still represent the same distribution because we pulled from the same population of penguins, but we would get different data. Now, I'm not trying to say that this highlighted vector changes every time you run it. Once you have a data set, it's fixed. But I want you to imagine more than one person going out 
and taking a random sample from the same population distribution of interest. If you took a sample, and then I took a sample, and then your friend took a sample, and then your friend's friend took a random sample, and your friend's friend's friend took a random sample, we would all have different data sets coming from the same population distribution. So I'm going to use R to help us simulate that idea. So it goes like this. Imagine we each go out into the population and we're each going to take a sample of 301 data points. Now to start with, let's just imagine our sampling is coming from a fair coin that will be flipped 10 times. So it's a fair coin and each of us are gonna flip the coin 10 times until we get 301 Bernoulli, I mean binomial observations. So let's do this, our binom NKP. So this first data point is me flipping a coin 10 times and observing six heads. This next data point is still me flipping the coin 10 times and observing four heads. This whole vector, whoops, sorry. This whole vector is me. This is all my one data set. It happens to be 301 binomial observations where each observation is how many heads we got from flipping a fair coin 10 times. So if you went out and took your own sample, here's a new data set. This is your own sample. And then if your friend went out there and took their own sample, they'd get their own data. Now, what we really want to start paying attention to is how the mean changes. If each of us took our own sample and each of us took our own mean, because our data are different, our means will be different. One more time, because our data is random, the mean is random. Okay, three times for the win. Because the data is random, the mean is random. The mean depends on the data and the data is random. So the mean must be random in the sense that if you took your own data set and I took my own data set and your friend took their own data set and we each calculated a mean from our own data, we would get three different means. They would all be estimating the same expectation. Each mean is estimating the same expectation and it's a fair coin flipped 10 times. So the means, the sample means, are all very close to five. The sample means are all very close to five. Okay, so now we're gonna introduce this next bit. How can we repeat this R times? And let's say we have, um, there's 499 of my friends and me for 500 of us. And we're each gonna calculate a mean. Here is 500 means, each of which is from the same population. Here is 500 means, each of which consists of adding up and dividing 301 numbers. Adding up 301 numbers divided by 301, and 500 people are doing that. Okay, so let's store this in a vector. This is many means. Okay, you ready? Here is the kicker the histogram of sample means 
will look approximately normal. And that's what the central limit theorem tells us. The central limit theorem says a histogram of many sample means will look approximately normal. Okay, we have four minutes of class left and I'm gonna spend that four minutes repeating the same phrase as close to the same way as I can. The central limit theorem dictates that a histogram of many sample means will look approximately normal. The central limit theorem tells us that a histogram of many sample means is going to look approximately normal. So even if I did this again, which gives me 500 new sample means, that's like another 500 friends of mine, which don't actually exist, each calculated their own sample. The histogram of those many sample means will look approximately normal. This is a mathematical law. This isn't just chance that these look normal. This is a mathematical law told to us by what we call the central limit theorem. It actually turns out to be totally cool because you could change K to 100 and P to 0.95 and just repeat this. And the central limit theorem tells us that the sampling distribution of many sample means will look approximately normal. This is what we're going to spend the week trying to understand. If you change the sample size, the histogram will get narrower. If you increase the sample size, the histogram will get narrower. And specifically, the histogram will get narrower, more concentrated on the expectation. If you increase the sample size, the histogram will narrow, concentrating on the expectation. And that's exactly what we were trying to draw in our statistics and context picture is the mean converges to the distribution's expectation as the sample size goes to infinity. It's exactly what we're seeing here. This distribution will collapse on the true expectation as your sample size goes to infinity. The central limit theorem dictates that many sample means will come from a normal distribution. It's literally a distribution of the sample mean. The sample mean is now to be thought of as a random variable. The sample mean is now to be thought of as a random variable because the mean itself depends on random variables. It is a random variable. It has a distribution and often that distribution is approximately normal. We're going to spend the entire week doing this. We'll try to do it with interaction, interactive web pages. We'll try to do it mathematically, and we'll try to do it in R. But I would like you guys to explore this kind of code on your own. You have an entire video to walk you through it, and this is being recorded. But I'll now stop recording now and field any questions you guys might have.